Well, good evening. Welcome. We're so glad you're here tonight, and uh, we are excited to be back at Teen Night. This is my fourth time preaching at Teen Night, third time um, opening up. I always ask for the opening night because uh, I just always love what God does in uh, the hearts and lives of teenagers uh, as he works and moves in your life and in my life. And it's important for us, before we get into the message, we won't be long tonight, but I do want you to open up your heart and your mind to what God has for you. And some of you have already decided you're not going to let God work in your life. You're here because somebody invited you. You're here because you saw some girl on Instagram say she was going to be here, and, and now you're here, or whatever the situation is. And so tonight you thought the last thing, the furthest thing from your mind was that somehow I would encounter God here in some way, shape, or form, right? Because, I mean, what, what does that have to do with teen night? But so many times in our lives, God works in ways that we never thought possible to bring us to a place that we would never expect where he would work in our life. What I'm trying to say to you tonight is this, that it is no accident that you are here tonight. It is not a happenstance. It is not something that is a coincidence. God, in his sovereignty and in his power and his grace and his mercy, has been working in your life to bring you to this moment tonight to allow him to work in your heart and in your mind so that he can bring you to a place where you surrender to him, where you follow him, where you trust him as your savior, whatever the decision is. And I'm so thankful that you are here tonight. We're in John chapter number 20. I'll read lots of verses here. You can follow along the best that you can possible. But John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29, the Bible says this. Now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was with them when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the marks of the nails and place my fingers into the marks uh, of the nails and place my hands into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here. And see my hands and put your hands and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Verse 28 of John chapter 20 says, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We see here this incredible uh, moment where Jesus Christ is risen from the grave. And by the way, I just want to remind you this, uh, this evening that Jesus Christ is alive. The reason why that we can celebrate and sing and we can praise and we can have grace and we can have church. And the reason why we are here tonight is not because Jesus Christ is dead in the ground. No, my friend, he is alive and well tonight. He is on his throne. He is the king of kings. Oh, yeah, you God's a good you can clap, you can shout, you can say whatever you want. The louder you get, the shorter I go. So, I mean, I'll tell you what makes some noise. Hey, Amen. Right? Come on now. Some of you are like, yeah, come on. You can say amen. amen. Yes. Some of you just want to amen, amen, amen. Yes. All right. Okay. But we, we celebrate the fact that Jesus is alive. If Jesus Christ is dead, then we have no hope. Let me say that again tonight. If Jesus Christ is dead, we have no hope. There's no reason to sing. There's no reason to have a teen night. There's no reason for me to drive two hours from Northern Virginia to come and preach the Bible. Why? Because we are dead and lost in our sin. We have no hope. We have no purpose. We have no direction. We have no redemption. We have no forgiveness. But praise God tonight, we can say here without a doubt, we know that Jesus Christ is a Alive. And we see in this passage here where Jesus comes to his disciples, those 12 guys that, that spent time with him, that he trusted, that he was around. And we see that when Jesus comes to them, one of them is not there. And the one that is not there, his name is Thomas. The Bible says in verse 24, it says, Now Thomas, one of the 12, called twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the situation is that Jesus Christ has risen from the grave. He is alive, and now he's going to go around and tell everybody. Listen, if I rose from the grave, I would probably tell a few folks. I'd probably post it on Instagram. Hey, thought I was dead? Hey, selfie. I'm not anymore, right? I would spread the news about the fact that I was alive. That's exactly what Jesus did. He went around and told everybody, and there came a point where he told his disciples, 
11 of them were there, or 10 of them technically were there, but Thomas, one of them, was not. Now the question is, who is Thomas? Why is he so significant? Well, if you, if you know history or the Bible at all, we, we know the phrase, doubting Thomas. Thomas was the one disciple who was known for doubting. As a matter of fact, if you look up in your dictionary, the phrase doubting Thomas will be in there. It's a noun. It represents a person. You can call somebody a doubting Thomas, and people most likely would understand what you mean. It means a person who is skeptical and refuses to believe something without proof. Literally in our dictionary, from this story, we find that the phrase doubting Thomas exists and it means a person who is skeptical, who refuses to believe something without proof. His name and his legacy is connected to doubting, to not believing, to not uh, uh, trusting, to being skeptical, especially about the resurrection. Can I say to you tonight this, very simply, that everyone has doubts about something. Everybody does. Everyone in this room has doubts about something. There's something that you don't fully believe in. There's something that you don't fully put your trust in. There's something that you are skeptical about that you, unless you have absolute, clear, unequivocally true proof, you will not believe it. I was that way when it came to minivans. <laughs> A couple years ago, we moved to Virginia. We had one car. And I told my wife, I said, Becky, I said, uh, it's time for us to get a new car. Don't worry about it. I got it all taken care of. I'll go find me a nice truck. Come on, have me with you on the truck. Come on now, right? You know what I'm saying? Come on now. A man needs a truck, right? Okay. I said, Becky, don't even worry about it. You go ahead and drive your nice Honda. I'll take care of you. Get the second car. I'll get myself a nice truck. So I began to look online for some trucks that, you know, suit my personality, you know, and just, man, it's one that I love. I was thinking about a black one, man, with, like, big tires, you know. I'm not really an outdoorsy guy, but I can act like I have a truck that is outdoorsy, you know what I mean? I mean, it was going to be sweet, man, with leather seats, all this I had it all picked out. And one day, my wife and I were talking, and she said to me, you know, I had a thought the other day. She said, instead of a truck, why don't we consider a minivan? And I said... I, I said, excuse me. I said, I said, I, I said these, I remember, I remember a couple years ago. I said these words. You know what the words I said. You know where I'm going with this. I said these words. I said, I will never, I will never drive a mini van. I am a man, okay? And a man needs a truck. Many vans. Now, I didn't say, I didn't yell at her like that. Like I said, it was a little softer, right? I said, no, we're not getting a minivan. I said, you, you, you can get a minivan when I'm dead and gone. Use the, use the money from the insurance to get the nicest minivan you want. But I need a truck, and that's settled. I'm a man of this house. I leave this home. We're getting a truck. And I remember, I thought, I don't want a minivan. I mean, well, minivans are like for moms, right? Like dropping their kids off at Beachmont Teen Night. That's what minivans are for, right? I've never seen like a cool dude like get out of a minivan. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you never want, you never see a guy like going from the mall or from a shopping center who's looking real cool, man, he's got his fit just right, you know what I'm saying? And he goes over and jump, jumps into a, a 2012 Honda Odyssey. No, no. The two do not go together. Coolness and the minivan do not go together, right? You lose some cool points when you get a minivan. A minivan is what you get when you don't want to be cool anymore, right? I told her, I said, I will never get a minivan. So a couple months went by, I looked for my truck, and she kept telling me. She said, you know, those minivans, I heard somebody say over here, they're real practical. I mean, they're like a truck, you know? We can fold the seats down. We can fit things in there. When I go pick up stuff, I'll have plenty of room, you know? I looked at her, I said, Becky, I will never get a minivan. I don't 
don't believe. I'm skeptical. I've got doubts about the minivan. A couple months later, we got our second car. We got a brand new white minivan. <laughs> Verse number 28, 
of our passage says Jesus comes to Thomas and he says, do not believe, do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered and said, my Lord and my God. And we see in this one moment, don't miss this tonight. We see in this one moment where Thomas, who was skeptical, Thomas, who wasn't sure, Thomas, who had questions. We see in this one moment where he goes from doubting to believing. I mean, it's like he flipped. It was like he was playing a game or something. You know what I'm saying? He went from doubting to believing in one moment. And my question is, how did that happen? We all heard that bottle drop. <laughs> how did that happen? How in the world does somebody go from doubting to believing in a moment? I mean, like, on this, like, like literally the same week. He went from doubting. He said, I will never believe to my Lord and my God. How did that happen? Let me, well, I'm going to give you a very quick and we'll be done tonight. I want you to see, first of all, the reason for the doubts. The reason for the doubts. Verse 24 says this. It says, now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. You know one of the reasons why he doubted probably was because the disciples were hypocrites. They were. Thomas was one of the twelve. And you know the story of Jesus and the crucifixion where he's dying on that cross? How many disciples were there? There was one. Where were the other eleven? They were all gone. They all fled. They all left. They all lived in fear. How do we know this? The Bible says this. It says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 56, it says, But all this had taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. That Watch this now. All the disciples left him and fled. Thomas, get this now, he wasn't with them. He wasn't with them. But the disciples, yeah, those same hypocrites who left and fled him, came in and said, oh, Thomas, oh, Thomas, come here, come here. And he's like, yeah, what's going on? We've seen the Lord. Oh, he's alive. Oh, we're going to serve him now. Oh, we're going to worship him now. And he probably looked at those guys and said, you bunch of hypocrites. You mean you're now you're going to serve him? How about when he was dying on the cross? How about when he was in his worst moment? You forsook him. He probably doubted because of the people that were telling him. He said, these guys are a bunch of hypocrites. I can't believe them. Can I say a very clear statement to you tonight? Very simple. I want you to know this. Whether you're a Christian or not, if you're skeptical, and maybe you're not a part of church or whatever, and you're not sure about Christians, can I tell you one thing that Christians are? Christians are are hypocrites. They are. And don't look at me like you're not. Because we all are hypocrites. We all sing, you're my wellspring overflowing. And then we look at something on Instagram we should. Well, come on now. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, TikTok, thank you. Keep me up to date. Right? We all sit there and go, you're never going to let. And then we go out and we, and we, and we say things we shouldn't. And we have wrong. Listen, 10 times right now, every Christian's a hypocrite. And Thomas, I think he, the reason why he was skeptical about the resurrection is because the people that were telling him that Jesus was alive lived a double life. They were hypocrites. And I'm telling you here right now, there are some teenagers in this room tonight who the reason why you're skeptical about following Jesus is because you see the hypocritical lives in the other people that call themselves Christians. Oh, come on, we're preaching now. Oh, yeah, I know it's not loud, but it's, oh, it's deep. Come on now. And some of you cannot wait to run as fast as you can out of the church doors because you don't want to be the same hypocrite that your parents are. Because you don't want to be the same as the hypocrites that you know the teenagers in the youth group that sit in the front row and wave their hands up are the same teenagers that have their hands all over each other. And it's hypocritical. Can I say to you this? Guess what? And you said, I'm not going to believe. I'm not going to follow Jesus because of a bunch of hypocrites. I think that Christians are nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. Can I say this? You're absolutely right. Nobody is perfect. Nobody. Is sinless. Let me tell you about this one Christian I know. I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor with this. We're recording this, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's this one Christian I know. I'll tell you this guy, right? Okay. I'm a pastor.
guys, I know things about people, they tell me things, right? Keep it between us, all right? There's this one guy I know, right? He gets up, like on Sundays, and he preaches God's word. And then sometimes, when his kids are annoying him, he yells at them. Can you believe that? I'm telling you. Let me tell you, hey, let me tell you. Let me tell you about this one guy I know. This one guy I know? This one guy I know, right? He talks about, listen, don't tell anybody. All right, don't tell anybody. Okay, listen. There's this one guy I know that, that he, he preaches about, like, being kind, and then he gets upset when they mess up his drink order at Starbucks. You know, I'm telling you. There's this one guy I know. <laughs> this guy is a hypocrite, man. I mean, this dude is the biggest hypocrite in all the world. He gets up sometimes, and he'll talk to people. He'll, like, come to, like, Beachmont Teen Night. This one guy I know. Right? This one guy. I'm telling you, man, this guy is a hypocrite, man. And this one guy, he comes to Beachmont, right? And he gets up, and he preaches, and he tells these Christians not to be hypocrites. And guess what? He's a hypocrite himself. Who am I talking about? Come on now. Come on now. Listen, listen, don't let, let me say it right here, don't let imperfect Christians keep you from believing in a perfect Christ. Come on now. God is not going to take that as an excuse of why you didn't live for him, of why you didn't serve him, of why you didn't believe. My time is going quick, but I'll, I'll hasten the Bible says in Romans chapter 7 and verse 18 and 19, it says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. He's hypocr- Paul even calls himself a hypocrite. You see, there is no perfect church with perfect people led by a perfect pastor. There's no perfect Christians. And I believe that Thomas struggled with doubt because the people around him were hypocritical. But the goal is not to judge ourselves by the people around us because there's one person who's not a hypocrite. There's one person who has never gone back on his word. He's never not done what he said. Jesus Christ is perfect and sinless. And I'm telling you, we need to understand that the reason why he doubted was because the people that were around him, but the disciples were grateful. And they said, we have seen the Lord in verse 25. Jesus brought them peace, not punishment. Even though they forsook Jesus in his worst moment, when Jesus came to them, he said, hey, I'm alive. He didn't punish them. He didn't get down on them. He didn't say, I can't believe that you left me in my hour of need. No, he said, hey, I'll come with you with peace. And no matter where you are, no matter what you've done in your life, no matter how far you've gone away from God, when you come back to God, God is not going to condemn you. He's not going to hurt you. He's not going to put it in your face and I told you your way wouldn't work. No, the Bible says that when you come back to God, when you believe, he offers peace. He offers forgiveness. He offers love. He offers restoration in our lives. Listen, this, this evening we have to understand that believing God's promise cannot be based upon someone else's behavior. I can't believe in God or doubt him simply because of how somebody else acts. I've got to decide if it's the truth for myself. And we see the reasons why he doubted. We see the people that were surrounding him. But then we see the, the verse 25, the conditions that he placed on God. It says this, but he said to them, unless I see the, the, his hands, the marks of his nails and Place my finger into the marks of the nails and place my hands to his side. I will never believe. You know why? You know why he might have doubted? Because he needed God to work his way. He said, okay, 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 right? All right. He had a, you know, Baltimore accent, right? All right. All right, here's the thing. All right, here's the thing. All right. He said, he said, I will believe as long as, come on now, believers. He said, I will believe as long as God works my way. You know what I'm saying? He said, he said, hey, if I can put the nails in his hand, like, if God will do what I want him to do, then I'll believe. But I'm not believing 
unless God works my way. Excuse me? Who are we to tell God how to work? Who are we to tell God what he needs to do? And some of you right now, the reason why you don't believe is not because of the hypocrites around you, but the reason why you refuse to believe and to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and to ask Him to be your Savior is because you say, I will believe, but God's got to do it my way. And if God blesses my life in a certain way, and if certain things happen or if certain things change, then I will believe. Can I tell you this tonight? I know in this room that there are things that have happened to you. There are things that you never would have chose to happen to you. I don't know what it is. It could be divorce. It could be a, a hurt. It could be a pain. It could be a loss. It could be depression. There's something in your life. And though you smile on the outside, you're hurting on the inside because something happened to you. And just like Thomas, Thomas said, wait a minute. Hey, these hypocrites forsook, forsook the Lord. And now I don't even know if he's alive. He's dealing with disappointment. He's dealing with doubt. And some of you right now are dealing with some deep issues in your life. And I know we laugh. And I know we have fun. And I know we talk about many things. But just for a moment, can I get serious? For a moment, can you be honest with yourself? For a moment, can you just open up and say, you know what, in your mind, yes. There are some things that have happened to me. What I've learned about being a pastor is many times people don't deal with what they did. They have to deal with what happened to them. And right now, you're dealing with something in your life. A deep hurt. A deep pain. An emotion you can't shake. A feeling that won't go away. Thoughts that keep bothering you down. And I just want to encourage you tonight. I want to remind you of the grace of God as he works in all of our lives. That Thomas was the same way. And he said, you know what? Okay, if God would just change this circumstance right here. If God would just get this thought out of my mind. If God would just make this bad thing go away, then I would believe. Then I would trust him. And I'm telling you, God doesn't work your way. He only works one way. And he works through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen tonight, you may be chained by depression. You may be chained by loneliness. You may be chained by anxiety. You may be chained by confusion. You may be chained up by doubt and fear and lust. I don't know what it is that's chaining you, what sin has a hold of you. But can I say to you tonight, Jesus Christ came to set you free from any chain that binds you. He will forgive you. He will save you. He will help you. He will redeem you. He will set you free. He will make you whole. He will give you purpose. He will give you direction. He will give you the peace that you need. Don't try to figure it out yourself. Don't try to put God in this little box over here and say, hey God, you work my way like a little puppet and then I'll believe God comes to you tonight and in his grace and in his mercy, he has brought you here tonight not to play basketball, not to meet a girl, not to get a cool Instagram photo. He brought you here tonight because he is asking you, do you believe? Do you believe that I can set you free? That I can make you whole? That I can forgive you? That I can break those chains? That's why you're here tonight. Just like Jesus came to Thomas, comes to you. You know, often, so many times when it comes to believing, we kind of make it so emotional. I talk to people sometimes, you know what they'll say? I'll say, tell me how you became a Christian. They'll say, oh yeah, no problem, no problem. They'll say, one day I was walking in a field. I'm, I literally, I'm not even joking, I'm not even like, exaggerating. They'll say, one day I was walking in a field and I looked up at the sun and a bird flew by. When that bird flew by, gust of wind came across my face. And when that gust of wind came across my face, it was a little bit warmer than usual. And I heard a voice say, Jesus. And I looked up and I saw the clouds and they were in the shape of a cross. And that's how I'm saved. And, you know, honestly, I think sometimes the reason why people respond that way is because they think they think that like Accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior is supposed to be like this really emotional thing. But it's not. It's not. 
It's actually a very simple decision. Let me explain this way. Jesus died, rose again from the grave, <clears throat> providing salvation for us so that we could believe. There are things in our life that cause us to doubt. So that we're skeptical about believing and putting our faith in Jesus Christ. Is he really the Messiah? Is he really God? Can he really save me? Can he free me from these chains that bind me? And the answer is yes, but just because I say it doesn't mean you believe it. And so you come to a team night like this, and a guy gets up and he talks about the gospel. Let me give you what the gospel is. The gospel is very simple. It's the death, it's the burial, and it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. We call it gospel, or it means good news. And the Bible says this. That we are all sinners, and because of our sin, we're separated from God. The moment we're born, we're separated from God. And so Jesus Christ came, died, was buried, rose again, gospel, to provide a way for salvation. Why? Because he was not sinful. He was sinless. And so he could take upon our sins and then offer forgiveness. And the Bible says... In Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you ask the question, how do I become a Christian? How do I get saved? Is it an emotional thing? No. It is a simple decision. Let me show you what I mean. It's like, I'm going to stand here. And then I'm going to decide to take a step and stand over there. Everybody watching? We good? Please, here's you got me in the back. Here we go. Ready? All right. I'm standing here. I'm deciding right now. To stand over there. You ready? Here it comes. Don't miss it. Here we go. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate that. It's like clapping for the dog. Yay, good boy, good boy. All right. Now let me let me break let me break it down. Ready? Here we go. Here we go. Ready? If you're here tonight and you're like Thomas, you're like, I'm not sure if I believe. Like I, I this is like my first time around like a team thing and then the Christian thing. I've never even been around since. I don't even know, like, all this stuff. I don't even try to go to church. Can I say to you tonight, if you want to believe and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's a simple decision. You're not saved, and you believe I'm a sinner, I need a Savior, and I'm trusting in Jesus to be that Savior and Him alone, and I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to ask Him to save me. And now I'm saved. When I was 14 years old, I made that decision. And tonight, you know, you know why Thomas was able to go from doubting to believing? You know why? Here it is. Because he made the decision to believe. He decided to believe. He decided when he was presented with the truth that Jesus was alive, he decided to stop doubting, and he believed. And maybe... That's the exact decision that you do make tonight. Here's what we're going to do. We're not trying to be magical, spooky, or emotional. We don't need any of that, all right? But some of you, there's two, there's two groups of people in this room tonight that I think the Lord's laid on my heart to talk to. Number one are those who believe but are doubting. And you're doubting because something has happened to you. You're hurting. Maybe tonight would be the night that you take the step back to full surrender. Not getting saved again, because the Bible teaches you only to get saved once. But going and trusting God fully and not doubting in His goodness and grace. And maybe you need to talk to someone about that. In a moment, our band's going to come and play. Not right now, man. But in a moment, our band's going to come and play. And when they do, I think we got some counselors, right, Mr. Stewart, in the back? Got some counselors over here in this dark corner over here, right? Okay, you can't even see them unless they smile with their white teeth, all right? And if you need, listen, seriously, if you need to like to talk to someone, like honestly, I grew up, man, broken home. Mom was an alcoholic, went through a lot of hurt in my life. I, my dad was absent my whole life. I don't know who he is, where he's at. And I, if someone talked to me, I might, I might go talk to someone about that. Hey, I'd like to believe, but man, there's a lot of kind of bad things that happened to me. So I'm kind of like trying to figure all that out. Maybe you would go talk to a spiritual counselor that would just pray with you, would just help you. Maybe you believe, but man, the things that happen to you are starting to cause you to doubt. In a moment, I'm going to invite you just to walk to the dark corner. No one even see it. It's so dark over there, right? Walk to the dark corner, find somebody, 
and say, hey, I just want to pray with somebody or talk to someone about what I'm going through. And that'd be a huge step. Now, the second group of people are people who are doubting, watch this now, who are doubting and have yet to decide to believe in Jesus Christ. And if you've never made a decision to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, then I would encourage you to go over to the dark corner and find somebody and tell them, hey, I've never made that decision before. I don't know. And they would love to talk to you about how you can make that decision. Now listen, I don't care if one person goes. I don't care if everybody goes. It doesn't matter to me. God brought me here to preach the message. That's what I've done. This is my one job. I've done it. Now you have to decide how you're going to respond to the message. And you've got to be honest with yourself. And I would say the one thing I don't want you to do is sit there and lie to yourself that you're okay. Because can I tell you this tonight? When it comes to Christianity, let me say this. I say this to my church all the time. Our church time. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay. This is a safe place. Sometimes I yell at my kids. Sometimes I'm mad at the first at Starbucks. Sometimes I, I, I sin a lot. <laughs> Every day, actually. Pretty consistent at it, actually. Pretty good at it. But you know what? God gives me grace. It's only when I hide that that I'm kept from growing. But when I'm vulnerable and open, come on now. That's when God can work. And God did not bring us here tonight, I'm telling you. God didn't bring you here tonight so you could stay hidden. So you could stay broken. So you could stay chained to what you're dealing with. He brought you tonight to begin that healing process. And don't let a friend or the actions of somebody else in your life keep you from your relationship with God that he wants for you. There's no joy found outside of a relationship with God. No peace. No freedom. Outside of a relationship with God. And we see, we don't have time, but Thomas found that. And he believed. And his life was changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And maybe tonight that would be your decision. I'm going to ask the band to come tonight. If some of the members of the band would come. And as they do, I know we're a little, uh, a little over a little bit, but that's all right. Just text your parents or whatever. Tell them you'll be out in a minute after you do some business with the Lord. I'm sure they'll wait in their minivan for you after you do a business with God. Okay? I'm going to have the band come. You guys can get in place. I'm going to pray. Here's what's going to happen. Here's the actionable steps after this message tonight. I'm going to pray. The schedule says we're supposed to close out the... Uh, the time tonight with a song. And so before we close out with a song, we're going to have a little buffer time for you to be able to go over and just talk to the counselor. I know he's like, I don't even know anybody over there. That's okay. Maybe ask a friend to go with you, right? Maybe make you feel more comfortable. But, but, I, but I'm going to pray. And then when I, after I pray, like the moment I pray, the band is just going to start playing and making noise back there. All right? Okay? And I'm going to have everybody stand. And when we have everybody stand... That would be a great moment, like, to go, all right? And just to talk to somebody. Listen, I'm telling you this tonight. There's no pressure to go, stay. You can, I'm not trying to get you to do anything. But, but as, a, as a pastor and as a friend, I'm telling you tonight that Jesus Christ came to set you free from whatever is chaining you right now. And you can try all you want to try to set yourself free. You can try to get more friends. You can try to get more followers. You can try to get more views. You can try to get more money. But nothing will satisfy. And God is speaking to some of you right now. And I pray that you would listen to him as he speaks and respond. As he went, whether you're sitting in the main floor or up in the bleachers. I don't care if you're a counselor, you're a camp staff. I don't know who you are. God speaks to everybody. Maybe you do business with God tonight. That's our, that's, our, that's our opportunity for you tonight. Let me pray. Band will play. We'll stand. You go. Lord, we love you, God. Thank you for who you are. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your power. Thank you, Lord, that you set us free even when we doubt, even when we wonder, even when we worry. God, you set us free. And so, Father, tonight I pray that you would set some people free tonight. God, we have no power on our own. My words don't have power. My expressions don't have power. My stories mean nothing. But God, your word has all power to work. And I pray it would tonight. 
Lord, I pray for that one teenager who's trying to hide in the corner somewhere and open that they don't have to, God, I pray you work in their life. I pray, Lord, for that one teenager maybe here tonight that is overwhelmed by a feeling or thoughts. They're dealing with something. God, I pray tonight would be the night they would just take that first step. Lord, to believe in who you are. God, I pray for the teenager here tonight who has never made a decision, like we talked about, to accept Jesus. Not going to church or being baptized, none of that gets us saved. But, but Lord, they don't know. They can't clearly and consciously say, yes, yes, I've made a decision to accept Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would work in their life. And they may go talk to somebody tonight, make a decision. Father, however, however you want to work, we trust you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. The band's going to kick up the noise a little bit more. And tonight, if God's supposed to your heart, why don't you move right now? Don't wait. Don't hesitate. The band's going to play. A little louder, man. There we go. We've got some folks moving tonight. We've got some young people moving tonight. Maybe in an attitude of prayer. Maybe your head's bowed, eyes closed. That way we give some people some privacy if they want to move. There we go, man. So if the folks are moving tonight, we don't want to get in God's way. So maybe you got to move. I see some folks moving. In. We won't call you out. I don't even know your name. I promise you. But maybe tonight you need to do business with God. Tonight maybe you would move. Maybe you would go. Maybe you would begin that process of healing. That process of being set free. That process of finding hope in Jesus Christ. I see some more folks moving tonight. Maybe you grab a friend. Listen, tonight we're not trying to make you do anything at all. You can stay right where you're seated. But tonight maybe God has worked on your life. Don't sit there chained. Don't, don't sit there lost. Come on now. God's got a greater plan for you than that. He has set you free. He has provided a way. I see some more movement. Thank you. Thank you. Heads bowed. Just give them a moment. Just give them privacy. If you're a Christian and man, you're strong in your faith, maybe you pray right now. Lord, help people to move. Help them to move. Maybe you would pray to yourself, God, speak to me. God, do, do I need to go? Do I need to? Is there something in my heart, my life? Others are moving tonight. Do you know for sure you're saved? Have you made a decision to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? Maybe tonight you would take a step and say, you know what? I'm going to learn more about that. I'm going to find out more about that. I'm going to stop hiding. I'm going to stop being chained. I'm going to start believing. The band's going to keep playing. A little louder band, if you would mind. Make some noise for the room tonight. There you go. You can lift it up. And tonight, maybe you would move. I don't know. Is there anybody else? Maybe wants to take a moment to move and talk. Maybe you just pray in your seat. If you're not sure that you're a Christian, the Bible is very clear. It says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you're here tonight, maybe you don't want to move, maybe you're embarrassed. That's okay. Maybe you don't, you don't want to move, you don't want people to notice. That's okay. You can hear me right now where I'm at. We'll come to you. I, not literally, but I'm talking to you tonight. If there's never been a time where you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then tonight, maybe right when you're seated, you would just call out to the Lord, as the Bible says. And pray this simple prayer of faith. Just pray to the Lord right where you're seated. This is the same prayer I prayed when I was 14. Maybe tonight you would say, Dear Lord, just say this prayer to the Lord tonight as a prayer of salvation. Say, Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't get to heaven on my own. But right now, I trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior to take me to heaven when I die. I'm trusting in Him and Him alone for my salvation. If you pray that simple prayer of faith, the Bible says that God has heard your prayer. He's forgiven you of your sins, and now you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I encourage you to tell somebody about that. Maybe a friend. Maybe someone in your life. I see more people moving. Anybody else want to join? I see more that are moving tonight. Do business with God. On a Tuesday night, who, who would have thought? Who would have thought God would have moved in your heart on a Tuesday night at a camp? But this is the time. This is the place that God has brought you to, to work, to move you from doubting to believing, to move you from fragile faith to strong faith, to move you to a place of surrender in your life where you would say, God, you are my source. You are the chain breaker. You are the one who sets me free. Father, thank you, Lord, for this time tonight. God, I pray you bless us, Lord, as we end this time with a worship. Father, I pray that, God, you would be glorified and honored. Thank you, Lord, for how you moved, how you
how you're working. Thank you, Lord, for being gracious to us when we doubt, when we don't believe. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the grace to believe again. Father, I pray that you would work, that your word would not return void, that, Father, you would be magnified and glorified, and that the one name, the name of Jesus, will be lifted up in this place tonight. Lord, we give you all the honor and all the glory and for what you've done and what you'll continue to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.